So today I'm here with Simon Renee from the Mindful Men podcast in Australia, and he talks all about modern masculinity, as well as being a dad, a social worker, and some of his struggles with mental health along the way as well. So I'm really excited to dive a little bit more into your journey today and talk about some of the things that you're passionate about. So do you want to just introduce yourself, tell everybody who you are, why you're here before we get into the juicy content? Yes, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'm Simon. I'm 39 years old. I live in Queensland, Sunshine Coast in Australia. Um, I'm a husband and I'm a dad to two kids. I've got a two and a five-year-old. So we're in the, the, the midst of mayhem in our household. Um, and I own a private practice called Mindful Men, which is a dedicated mental health service for men. Um, and I pick men because, um, A, we struggle to talk about things, and B, I've lived with mental illness for th over 30 years, so I know how hard it is to talk about stuff, and, and I bottled it up for 20 years, so it's only been 10 years since I've been openly talking about mental illness in my life. So, so yeah, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks for sharing. And I know it is my dog's barking. I know it is an unfortunate reality for a lot of men out there who are just scared to open up about their feelings because it is so frowned upon by society. Um, so can you start yeah. off by telling us a little bit about your mental health journey and what some of those experiences looked like? Yeah, sure. So it all started around eight years old and, and I remember being in the schoolyard um, and, a, and a student said to me, Simon, if you don't talk for more than a minute, you're going to lose your voice forever. Now, most people would kind of hear that kind of thing and disregard it and move on. But for me, it planted a seed of what's now, what I now know is obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so for anyone who's listening, not really familiar with OCD, it's, it's an obsessive thought comes into your mind. It creates a huge amount of anxiety and you can't really relieve that anxiety like you might do something else in life and and the only way to relieve it is to perform what's called a compulsive act or a compulsion or a behavior so that's the c and ocd and for me when i had this humming uh, when i had this um this this thought about losing my voice forever i started humming and i would do it ever ever so quietly to myself like little hmm, hmm type things and i would do that for the next two years uh, because I was absolutely petrified of losing my voice forever. And, and you know, as an eight-year-old, I couldn't really comprehend life without a voice and, and, and all this type of stuff. So that was my entry into to mental illness. And, and I've had that for 30 years, OCD. I don't do the humming thing anymore. Like that was a, that was a two-year thing. But it evolved into a whole bunch of um, obsessive thoughts around safety and security. So particularly when I was a teenager, um, an early teenager, mum and dad split up and, and me and my little brother, we, we left with mum and we went and lived with mum and, and I felt like this overwhelming need to be the, I guess I was the man in the house. I had to, to protect everybody in the household and, and particularly at night time, like when we were locking up the house, like if you're a kid, or in your, even in your teens, you, know, you, you kind of rely on your mum and dad to go around and lock up the house and you can go to bed and you forget about all the issues in the world. But for me, like I would spend hours each night and I'm talking like two to three hours checking doors, checking windows were closed, checking the gates were locked outside because I had this overwhelming fear that someone was going to break into the house, steal our stuff or stab us when we're sleeping or even kidnap me and my little brother. Um, and so, yeah, I would check everything constantly and, and I'd even got to the point where I was also afraid of the house burning down when I was sleeping. So I would go around and check like the appliances were off, like the stove, oven, um, the fridge door was closed because I thought if the fridge was open slightly that the, the motor would burn and then it would start a fire and, and all this type of stuff. And I'd, I'd do that routine in a very set routine. So I'd have to do like the front door first and then the front windows and I'd go around methodically. And then I'd get to bed and my brain, and this is an OCD brain, really tricks us as well. It, it tells us a lot of lies, and it would say to me, Simon, did you really check that window? Did you check that door? Because when you walked away, maybe if you did check it, it might have like somehow popped open or something like that. So off I would go again, and this is why it took so long to get to bed, is because I'd get to bed, my brain would then 
tell me these lies and I'd have to go and do it all again. And that particular one still lives with me today. I'm, I'm you know, I'm 39 now and I still do this. I don't do it for as long as I did in my teens. Like that was two to three hours in my teens, but certainly it, it impacts me during like now as an adult. Um, but now I'm the one who is responsible for locking up the house at night because I'm the dad and I'm the husband as well. So that's what I do. Um, but it, it shows up in other ways. Like when I was in school, in high school, and even now, like in my professional career, I'd constantly be look, checking for my wallet phone keys. Well, back then in the 80s and 90s, there was no phone, so I only had to be my wallet and keys. But I would be checking these hundreds of times a day that are they in my bag because it's petrified again of someone getting my keys and my wallet. And because if they've got my wallet, they've got my, my ad- address maybe on, a, on an ID card. They've got my keys. They know where to come and find me. They know where to go and steal our stuff and, and wait for me when I come home. And and these things just fuel this, you know, depression came in and particularly my teens, depression came in because I was so tired of doing, being on alert constantly all day, every day. And, and yeah, like, and then like anxiety came in, generalized anxiety. And, and over the years, I grew more and more introverted as opposed to extroverted. The social anxiety came in. I didn't want to talk to people I didn't know. I became really fearful of people I don't know. Um, and even people I do know, I still get that anxiety around having to go out and socialize and, and, and just having to use a lot of energy to mark, put the mask on of mental illness and, you know, show the world that I'm okay and, and I can get through things. It's really tiring. And, and, and so they're the, the, the main ones that came into my life, but it wasn't until I was 28 that I finally, my wife, my now wife said to me, Simon, like the way you're showing up in our relationship is hurting us. Like it's, you're checking all these things. You're drinking too much. I was using alcohol to kind of numb the pain and, and slow down my thoughts because my brain would race a million miles an hour. And, and you know, I, was, I wasn't a very nice person to live with. And, and so she said, you've got to go get help. And so, yeah, 10 years ago, I drew up that courage. It's been something I'd been putting off for a couple of years earlier because I didn't want to be on medication. I had this thing about meds and it's like a bit of a taboo thing um, or shame thing. Um, but I finally got that courage and went and spoke to my GP and, I, and, I, and just saying the words, I think I have a mental health issue. Didn't really understand mental health even 10 years ago. Like it wasn't something that was hugely promoted in the community or in the media. And so, yeah, I said those words. It was really hard to say those words, but from there I was able to start a recovery process. And so in Australia, we get access to like subsidized psychology or counseling if we go get a mental health care plan. So I got myself one of those plans and went and saw a psychologist who did the diagnosis and we were able to track it back to when I was eight years old, roughly, of when this humming thing started and then OCD started. And, and I kind of knew but walking into that I had depression or some something like depression. I didn't, still didn't know what it was. Um, but when they said, you've also got OCD, you live with OCD, I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> you've never even heard of OCD. Because when we talk about mental illness, we mainly talk about depression and to a lesser extent, anxiety. And so OCD was like, what is this? But over 10 years, like it wasn't only until the last two to three years, and particularly when I've been studying social work, that I was able to really reflect on mental illness in the community, but also myself and my position in the world and, and, and things like masculinity and stuff like that. And, and in 2020, I experienced burnout and through burnout, I started my Instagram page for mindful men as a way to project out there what burnout was. But I also started throwing out these things like about OCD and depression and anxiety. And it's through Instagram that I found this community of people who live with OCD that I never knew existed in the world. I never knew people out there lived with OCD. Aside from me, I felt like something I was the only person living with. But there's a huge community out there and they're very passionate about sharing OCD stories and, and particularly educating people on what OCD is because it's often misunderstood and it's often joked about. So whenever people hear about OCD, they go, oh, you know, people with OCD like uh, a neat house, or a neat desk at work or a neat desk at school and they like to clean their hands like that's it i'm like but the more i looked into it and, and started to understand my ocd with the checking behaviors and all that i'm like ocd is much more than that it is not a personality trait it's a really 
debilitating disorder that influences our mental well-being and the way we interact and perceive the world as well so yeah there's it's funny how that instagram thing happened then i was open up my world to the ocd community and then i was at that community also introduced me to what's called exposure response prevention which is a great uh, therapy practice for ocd and i went and trialed that last year with with a psychologist here on the coast and found some really good results because of the 10 years prior I was doing a lot of more talk therapy and it just wasn't working but then I found exposure response prevention we're able to to focus less on the thoughts and talking and more on just preventing our behavior so preventing a lot of the checking stuff that I do or rewiring the brain as well instead of doing having to do things in order like one two three four five mixing up that order and going one three five two four or whatever and that's and been a really helpful tool that i've been using um but at the same time i also found mindfulness so this is the mindful and mindful man is mindfulness based practice around sitting with anxiety and accepting it into our life because it's going to come um but not responding to it in negative ways like drinking or whatever and then being mindful of who we are in different aspects of our life so how am i showing up as a man as a dad as a husband how am i showing up at work in my social life etc so so yeah that's been the journey over 30 years um and it's exhausting talking about it but it's fantastic talking about it because um not many many guys do and so I, I'm, I'm really passionate about helping guys to talk about this stuff because we've been conditioned not to talk about it you know particularly in my generation so Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I think you spoke to a lot of great pieces, one just being the misconception of OCD and what it really is. Um, so when we hear these stories, what it's actually like, you know, it's not just a personality trait or a word that people toss around like they do, like it's actually a serious mental illness that really affects your daily functioning. So hearing these stories is so impactful. So thank you for being someone that shares that. Um, but then also the masculinity side to things like, Many men just don't talk about their feelings and what they're going through because they've grown up to think that it's a weakness. They're not allowed. They shouldn't because they're not going to get the same opportunities. They're emotional. All the fun things mm. that I'm sure you've heard along the way. <laughs> um, so can you touch, can you talk to that piece, just like what role the toxic masculinity has actually played in your own perceptions of both what you were going through and then when you were actually reaching out for help? Yeah, so I guess toxic masculinity, there's a lot of stuff in the social media about that at, at this at the moment, particularly the last 12 to 24 months. And and there's, I guess, a few different sides of it, depending on, you know, our lived experience of masculinity. There's that there's the, the hyper-masculine, the macho, it's aggressive type guys, which I don't really fit into that category. I've never really experienced the hyper-aggression and like the physical stuff and and but i have more the emotional stuff and it's the stuff around shaming us if we want to talk about things and so forth so so i grew up in the 80s and 90s before you know social media before smartphones all this type of stuff in the northern suburbs of adelaide so that's a very working class place to, to grow up pockets of welfare so low socioeconomic um a lot of people in the trades and manufacturing style business um businesses and so when I think back to that time, my worldview, because the internet wasn't really around either, like, like my worldview was, was, I guess, developed by the guys around me. So I grew up with three brothers and plus dad in the household until we, we left as well. Um, so, and we did a lot of sport. So we did Australian rules football. So it's a very masculine sport, very much of a physical sport, no padding on us, but we get hit from all different directions. Um, the teachers the male teachers in my life but if even like extending it to what i watched on tv like if a movie came on you, you're talking about movies like the terminator die hard rambo like these are big movies with big masculine hyper masculine guys in them um and that was influenced because i had older brothers as well so that's what they wanted to watch so that's what i watched as well and through that time you know to play football for example if you got hit on the football field you don't want to lay on the ground crying about that because you'd be ridiculed and you'd be kicked off the team or whatever. You've got to get up. You've got to dust it off. You've got to be this man. You've got to be a man. You know, that's what men do. They get hit, they get knocked down, they get straight back up again. 
and you don't cry about it as well. You've got to bottle that up, and if you show tears because that's weakness, you'd be labelled like as as a girl, um, you know, or you'd be labelled as gay. You know, that was that was the opposite of being a man as well, and so like a lot of shame and and so forth came around emotional well being and emotions and no and mental health like. I don't ever remember discussion around mental health, like until I was in my late twenties. And so because that wasn't even in our dictionary, I didn't even know what it was. And and so if you're experiencing that depression, anxiety, OCD, there's no way to even talk about it because you don't even know what it is. And so we bottled it up and, and, and that's what I did as well. I bottled it up. I remember being in, in the primary school around that eight years old, you know, maybe 10, my best mate was crying in the in the schoolyard, and because I've been socially conditioned like this, you know that this whole boys don't cry because that's what men do. I went up to him and I went into automatic mode, and I said, "Mate, you've got to stop crying. You can't let people see you crying because boys don't cry." And he, and it was a wonderful thing because he said to me, "Simon, I can cry if I want to," and that particularly planted a seed that that everything I'd been learning as a boy was maybe not right. You know, maybe we could cry and I was allowed to because if I got hit on the football field, I would actually, my, my, my eyes would well up. I was a, I'm a bit of a softy. I was never the kind of hyper-masculine guy that would just love to get into fights and, and throw, throw my fists around. I'm a, I'm, I go into flight mode. I'm a runner. I, I run away from all that type of stuff. I hate that type of stuff. And so for years I was, you know, this trying to figure out my place in the world based on these social constructs. And even into my adult years, like drinking became a way of bottling it all up and masking it because, you know, when I have a few drinks, I could relax. I could be my more natural self, whatever that is. And also I wouldn't have to think about things. I could just, you know, think about other things other than mental illness. And and it would give me like a bit of extra social, you know, I guess, gusto to go out and actually socialise because I, I wasn't so fearful of talking to people. And so that was, was my coping mechanism. And that was another masculine thing in Australia. We have a huge drinking culture. Like, that's what we do. And from 18 as well, even if, like we start drinking probably 16, you know, it's a bit of a rites of passage. And so that became, and for many guys, that's become a way of coping with the world. And, and you know, so just that that's a normal part of my life. And so to break out of that was a first a recognition that things weren't right. It was that 10 years ago when I go, you know, yeah, I'm I'm now recognising that I'm hurting my relationship with my wife, my, my now wife, and, and I'm not showing up in the world like I could be. And the only way to really start challenging that stuff is to go and talk to someone about these things, which goes against everything that men have been told, that they can't cry and they can't show emotions and they can't talk about things. But to let out a good cry is a huge release in, in a lot of ways. Like I've done breath work in the last year. I've never would have done breath work in my life. But just doing that enabled me to cry because I would let my guard down. I just cried and cried and cried, and it was such a great release. And so me now sharing these stories, I hope, inspires other guys to recognise that the stuff that we grew up with in the 80s and 90s and, and before that, you know, um, and even now, like it's, it's still happening now today, is like, is like maybe it's not true and maybe we can get emotional and talk about things. And, in fact, it's a healthy thing to do because when we don't, we can turn into volcanoes and that's when that hype, that toxic masculinity comes out. So if you look at family and domestic violence data, men are overwhelmingly the perpetrators of family and domestic violence, which for me as a dad and a husband just makes me sick because I could never think about hurting my family, but other guys do. And I think they do it because they don't know a healthier way to just express that pent up anger or emotion. It just bursts out. And some of them have been conditioned for that from their upbringings as well. That's how they see the world. They might have seen their parent, their dad hit their mum or whatever. And so that's that that intergenerational toxic masculinity coming out because the guys just don't know how to do it properly, do it safely, do it in a healthy way through counselling or through, you know, self-discovery, self-reflection and, and all that type of stuff. But the other one is suicide data. And, and guys particularly in Australia... And I think it's a similar in the US as well, like 75% of, of deaths by suicide are male. Um, and that's, and I think that again is 
because we struggled to open up and talk about these things and we, ha- we feel like that's the only way out. But it's not the only way out. There's so many more other ways like therapy, medication, mindfulness. Just talking is a huge release um, and, and challenging those social constructs. And it's, and it's doable. Um, you've just got to kind of reflect inwards and go, okay, whatever's happening right now is just not working anymore. I've got to change. It's wild how interconnected it all is and just how influential things like movies are or generational standards, things that your dad might have told you or you you heard your friends say at school. Like those things really stick with you, whether you want to acknowledge it at the time or not. And it really just builds up to all these other stats, like the suicide stats, domestic violence. And it like all trauma, like we need to go to the root of it. Where is this starting from? Mm. How are we getting here? Why are we getting here? Like, what can we change to really change the outcome on a greater scale? Um, So talking about that and how toxic masculinity really affected you growing up, what is it like now to be a man who openly speaks up about his emotions and well-being? Like, what are some challenges that come with that even today? Um, I think if I look back at 10 years ago, it was just getting the words out of my mouth, at that GP. Like I choked on the words that they came out and because it was going against all these social constructs and everything I knew about what it meant to be a man. But what I found is the more and more I talked over the last 10 years in different therapies and even with my partner, like my wife now, like she's a very good sounding board for this type of stuff. It just feels, it just gets easier every single time. And I always, I, I, when I think about this particular question, I, I think about when I went through burnout. So in 2020, I was, I went through burnout. I hit a, an emotional, physical, spiritual brick wall. And I just was basically, I was a spud. I couldn't function at all. I was sitting on the couch and I was just a mess. And I had to take four months off of work. And at that time I was, you know, working a nine to five job in a high stress environment. I was studying part-time in a master's degree, so my master's of social work. So I was doing that outside of hours in the evening on the weekends. We had two kids under three. Um, We had COVID happen. So then we went into lockdown for five to six months initially, and then we came out, then we went back in and came out, went back in. And I developed also like a back issue that I didn't know where it come from. And I couldn't diagnose like what what was the cause of it. But I think what was the cause of it was the stress that I was under and, and, and this burnout mode. And and part of my recovery process that I felt like I needed to do was, as I said before, I was like set up that Instagram account to talk about burnout. But I also went back to work and I shared my burnout story because I knew so many people at my work were stressed. And I thought, okay, let's use this as an opportunity for me to show everybody, A, what burnout is, because we hadn't really talked about it at the workplace. And it was actually something that, I worked in a national agency and a lot of people across the country were experiencing it. And and so A, to talk about what it is, but B, to show that guys can talk about this stuff. And it was it was fantastic because so many people came up to me and said, Simon, I'm experiencing this. Well, Simon, my husband or my brother or my dad's experiencing similar or I'm so, so thankful for you talking about this type of stuff. And it prompted some people to go see their GP, which was fantastic. And so just doing that, I felt this huge release. Like I'd been talking about it in therapy, but that wasn't the same as doing it publicly. And, you know, I'd have small discussions with my wife, but it wasn't the same as having my own podcast, which I now have talking about this or coming on your podcast or other podcasts and talking about this stuff. And now like I get so much energy from it. And I said before it was tiring. It's tiring because you're releasing 30 years of mental illness, but it's also such so invigorating. Like, like for me, getting up at 6 a.m. to do a podcast, I would never have done that in my old career. Um, and now I've got my own mental health therapy business dedicated to helping guys. Like I've got three guys today that I'm seeing as clients and they're all brand new. They've never come and seen me before. So one guy's never even been in therapy before. So I'm really excited to see them and just help them through this process and say, look, you might be really struggling talking about this stuff, but I'm your example. Use me as the example that you can do it and you can have a, a successful life and a career. You can have family, you can live with mental illness and get through this and you can take off that mask 
and be the guy that you've always wanted to be, not the guy that you've become on autopilot because you were told you're never able to talk about this type of stuff. And the guys that I work with particularly, like when we start talking about this stuff, and I do a lot of mindfulness-based stuff, but I also do a lot of values and identity stuff, so we're challenging some of these things in, in therapy, and they just they love it. They really buy into it because they can go, okay, yep, yeah, it's not just me talking about my problems, but it's also me developing those critical reflection skills about who I am as a person, who I want to be, and, and setting up strategies to, to really work towards a better version of me. We're almost like, and I'm in that sense, like I do this also because I'm trying to be the guy that I wish I had when I was eight years old who could tell me that everything's going to be okay and that you can get through it. And, and rather than me then spend the next 20 years trying to figure it out in my head because it had no other way to conceptualize mental illness. Um, so yeah, it, it's daunting and, and talking about it is hard initially, but the more and more guys can, can do it, the easier it becomes. And then it eventually it becomes like your passion. Like it's my passion now. Like I love talking about it because a, it's a, it's, I, it's a bit of a therapy for me, a therapeutic process for me. I can talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And, you know, I, I, rem I start to remember little things that I've forgotten that I've done over the years and, and share those and, and help the world feel less isolated as well. It's kind of, kind of like that Instagram moment for me with the OCD community. All of a sudden I found all these people that had OCD and I didn't, in, didn't know they existed. So by a guy listening to this or a partner listening to this, they can then give it to their husband or, or boyfriend or whatever, or brother or, or dad. Then they can go, oh, there's another guy talking about it. I can do it too. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it is challenging, but it's possible, and, and that's why I do it. Exactly. Yeah. Every time you share, every time someone else shares, it just contributes to normalizing the conversation and making pe people feel less alone in whatever struggle they're going through. It doesn't have to be OCD. It doesn't even have to be mental health related. Maybe you're just having a bad day and you need to talk to someone. And that in itself has been mm. so shut down for men for all of time. Um, so really, I do appreciate you and everything you're doing to help change that because even though I am not a man myself, like I see it around me. I see it in my brothers. I see it in my dad, my family. Um, so it really does go such a long way. And you touched on the mindfulness piece, mm. um, which I really want to hear about. So can you just expand on that a little bit more and just explain what it means to you and how it's really helped to shape the person that you've become? Yeah. So, <clears throat> So I discovered like through the burnout process, I was introduced by one of my, like a mental health social worker. So that's like a counselor as well. And that's kind of what I'm working towards um, to this practice of mindfulness. And I never really heard it before. And and the first time she said it, <laughs> I was like every, like every guy, I'm like, I'm not doing that. That's just sounds not masculine at all. It sounds hippie almost. Um, but like we started slowly we, and I did it started with gratitude journaling or, or gratitude, like a journal. Yeah. And, but it just didn't really work for me. Like I, I felt like I was just reflecting on the same three, you know, family job, a house, and I was just regurgitating every day and it kind of lost its power after about a week. And so I kind of sat it to the side. I didn't really think about it anymore, but then I went back to counseling probably a year later and, and someone said mindfulness again. And I'm like, why are we talking about this again? I don't want to be doing like gratitude journaling. It just doesn't work for me. But this next counselor, you know, put it within the context of therapy. And it was comes from particularly the one that I focus on is acceptance and commitment therapy. So it's accepting the emotions as we come into them and, and committing to a course of action that's based on our values. And so that's goal-based stuff that's based on our values. And, and, we revisited the journaling thing again, but we, we flipped the script a little bit and he showed me a cool technique around finding the gratitude in our day. And the reason we were doing that is because I'd lost joy. Depression takes, zaps joy out of your life. And he said, what you do is you, you instead of writing the three big things, because everyone struggles with that, is actually break down your day in hourly chunks and write down what you did in that hour. So it could be between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m., it's the morning routine with the kids and getting them to school. Or it could be like between 9 and 10 a.m. you went for a coffee with somebody and just list out your whole day like that, what you did. 
And then from there, you can see the little things that you're grateful for, like that cup of coffee with my mate at the cafe and having that connection. And so these aren't big things. They're not like the house, the, the health, the work or whatever. It's the, it's the little things in your day that you find joy. Like I love coffee. I'm, I'm having a coffee with you now. And so that's for me is, is a gratitude thing. A, the coffee, but also having this discussion around mental health. Like, it's, like this is a cool thing. And that sort of fills my cup up. So when we were able to do that, I was like, okay, I can start to find those little pieces of joy in my day. Like you could be going out the garden, seeing a flower that's coming up on one of the, on one of the plants. Or finally, we've got a lemon tree that's finally growing tr- lemons after about 10 years of having this lemon tree. Like I was about to, I was about to, to rip it out of the ground, but now we've got lemons, so it's, it's staying. Um, so just things like that, like a little bit of gratitude like that. But then mindfulness, it, it, we took it a bit further, and, and I really struggle with um, being present in the moment and being grounded. And so my mind would be racing, and I'd be thinking about a million other things other than what I'm doing right here right now so i could have a full conversation with you about all this stuff but be on a different planet and and so i'm not at the moment i'm, I'm right here with you so don't worry <laughs> um, but yeah like i could be on a different and, and, and that comes out with my kids for example my kids could be talking to me and i'll be like not even listening or my wife could be talking to me i'm not listening and so from a mindfulness based approach we were starting to use our five senses to come back to earth basically and particularly during my burnout process, I was doing a lot of walking. So I'd be walking around in nature, but I wasn't really present on the walk. I'd be too stressed and thinking about so many other things. So what I started to do was was brush my hand on a bush as I walked past it. And then eventually I would rip off some maybe some leaves and crunch them in my hand to get that feeling of, and really focusing on that, to get that feeling of, okay, I'm here with nature, feel the texture in my hand, feel, you know, listen to the sounds of the birds, or the wind, or we've got some water near us, so like maybe some the water rushing past in the river, and use the five senses to come back to Earth, and and that really helped me because I hate being on a different planet, and my brain, and this is partly why I drink used to drink so much was my brain would race so much that I would lose track of you know what I was meant to be focusing on, or I could be focusing on too many things at once, and I get lost as to what I'm meant to be doing. So by mindfulness, we could actually just focus in on one thing and, you know, and whether or not that's breath work, doing some box breathing just to come back and, you know, feel the body sensation in, inside the body or it could be I did some men's yoga. So coupling that with slow movement just to, to, to feel like I'm doing something but I'm not thinking about anything else because I have to focus on the breath and the movement at the same time. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where mindfulness came for me and, and just being mindful of all that type of stuff. But then the social worker in me also came out and being mindful of how I was showing up in different environments. So what masks was I putting on at work, for example? It's one of a high achiever perfectionist one where I set the bar really high and I expect, A, myself to hit that bar, but also everybody else around me to hit that bar. And when that didn't happen, it would cause me a lot of distress. So, okay, like it was about... Did the bar even matter in the first place? And that's been something that's been ingrained in me since I was, you know, for 30 years because I think that that's part of the OCD. Um, Or how am I showing up at home? Am I being too hard on the kids because I want them to be perfect and I don't want them to experience, you know, things like I've experienced. I'm trying to be this helicopter parent. So it's being mindful about that and how I'm showing up with my kids and my wife and and, and in my social circles as well. Am I drinking too much to go and socialise? um that's something i struggle with like most guys we struggle with that type of stuff and and so it's being mindful of how much i'm drinking or or what am i doing when i'm socializing can we go away from meeting up at the pub and meet at a cafe for a coffee or or meet and go for a walk or something like that instead of the usual which is meeting up at the pub and having and just you know getting on the gas and and stuff like that so that's what mindfulness has done for me and 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 the little things that I'm learning along the way, and then I'm able to share this with the guys that I work with in Mindful Men as well. And a lot of it is just talking, is being mindful of, of the words that come out of our mouth and, and, and being mindful of why we're saying these particular words. So it's for me, for example, it's the story of growing up in the 80s and 90s. That's a critical reflection moment of me because it's a point in time that's very different to 2022 in terms of how we interact with the world and communicate and learn about the world. So it's being mindful about that as well. And 
and you know the technology that my parents had and the education that my parents had and and yes we didn't talk about mental illness like when i was growing up but it's not my parents fault you know they didn't know what it was either you know it's just they did the best with what they had at the time and so just be mindful of that and, and be mindful of the future and what that might look like for my son and daughter as they grow up as well I love that. And I really appreciate like the breaking things down into every hour of the day for gratitude, because I recently got like the five minute journal, the popular one. And I was really struggling with the three things every day. It just felt so repetitive. And I'm like, I don't think I'm getting anything out of mm. this. So I'm definitely going to try that. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, and yeah, cool. I just think mindfulness is becoming so much more popular because you can do so much with it, whether you actually sit down and meditate and like ground yourself in the moment or whether you go out for a walk. And like you said, like maybe you're touching a leaf and you're connecting to your senses. There's so many different ways you can be intentional about using mm. it. Um, so I love it. It's definitely become a huge part of my life as well. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I guess just wrapping up this no conversation worries. today, um, do you have any advice for anyone who might be currently struggling with these gendered social constructs and how can we minimize these ingrained beliefs, whether on an individual level or a larger scale? Yeah. So I think it all comes down to individual. That's the easiest thing to, to, to change is, is, and we, and we, we brushed on it. It's like nothing changes if nothing changes. So if you're recognizing that you're hurting or, or whatever it's like why are you hurting like why are you struggling so much with anger or emotions or just to talk about things and i often find like that that moment where someone reaches out for help is the moment where they reflect on that and they go yep i need to change something that's why i'm asking for help now as opposed to not asking for help for the last 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or whatever and i always come back to this tony robbins quote is like change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change so you're committing yourself to going, okay, yep, I realize that I need to change. So now I'm going to take some action because what I'm doing now is going to be worse if I keep doing that. And so it always starts with that self-reflective moment, that critical reflection and recognizing that you need to do something. Um, and also it could be if you you want to start challenging these social constructs more broadly, it's, it's looking around the people who are around you. Like, I mean, there's another one around, like, you're the average of the five people that you spend most of your time with. And so, like, if you're centered, if you're, if your five mates, best mates, are all guys who are that toxic masculine, you know, they come from that, they love it, they're, they're, they're talking about women in a degrading way, or they're, they're using, you know, anti, they're, they're homophobic, or they think that guys, their role is to be this patriarchal thing, and, and there's equalities, is, is BS and, and all this stuff. If they think like that, then you're going to think like that. But if you want to change that, it's maybe spending less time with those kind of guys and, and looking for guys or women, you know, men and women as well. And this could be family members as well. And, you know, that's a really important thing. This could be family members. It could be your dad, you know, for example, is looking at those and going, uh, is it worth me being in this circle? And do I need to change this circle? Because, that's when you can start to, to influence things more broadly because if you're taking on all their baggage as well and their, their views and then you feel like you can't say what you really think, maybe you think maybe you want to be the stay-at-home dad but all your mates are like, no, nah, that's for women to do that type of stuff, you know, but you want to be the stay-at-home dad. Well, maybe you need to go find other stay-at-home dads and make them your circle and it's tough to cut those ties, it is, and it, and particularly family, but sometimes it is so worth it because then you start to see the world in different ways. You can start to express yourself a bit more freely. Um, you'd be more comfortable in yourself and, and you start li like living a life full of joy again because the people that you're aligning yourself align with your values. And, and maybe it's value, you don't know your values. So it could be working with someone who does acceptance and commitment therapy and saying, I want to work on some values work with my therapist, with a therapist or a counselor or a coach or whoever it is. Because when you start reflecting on that and using your values in, in, in your friendships and your social circles, but also your work and, and, and your aspirations uh, could be your, your identity as a dad or whatever, then you can start living a more purposeful life and, and, and all that type of stuff. So I think that's a really critical thing is, is who are you surrounding yourself with? What are you ingesting? 
in terms of media, you know, books or whatever? Are you, are you doing stuff that reinforces all this BS that we've been living with for 30 years or 40 years? Or if you want to flip the switch, flip the switch, you know, start consuming stuff that, that does, that talks about new age parenting or, or being a dad for the future. You know, climate change, if that's, you know, I'm worried about what the climate's going to look like for my kids. So it's, it's, it's reading up about that type of stuff or involving myself. It's not, yeah, it's not putting down people for different worldviews. And that's why I do on Mind for Men podcast is I have worldviews of people that come in, like like women as well, because it's important for guys to, to see the world from different perspectives. And you can do that by changing your circle. Um, but it's really hard to minimise something that is, it is society-wide. We've been living with it for years, particularly in Western culture. This is a very Western culture thing, um, but it doesn't mean we, mean we can't impact or minimise the impact on ourselves. And so by challenging it, recognising it, um, and then, yeah, finding new sources of information, of inspiration to change the world or change the way that we perceive the world, that they're some critical things that we can do. Um, but it all comes down to talking and just talking about things and talking it out because you, you can't solve everything in your head. Sometimes you need to, to bounce it off other people, whether it's mental illness, relationships, identity, fatherhood, work, stress, whatever it is, just start talking. And that's a great place to start, to start challenging these things, that these constructs that guys can't talk and they shouldn't talk. I think that's an amazing answer. And a lot of it does start at that individual level. It's making those hard choices, asking yourself, who am I surrounding myself with? What type of media am I consuming? What side of TikTok am I on right now? Is this reaffirming the beliefs that I have? Is it challenging mm -hmm. um, some negative stereotypes? Like whatever it is, you can really, you have the power to put yourself in a better position, whatever that is. The books you're reading, the mm -hmm. movies you're watching, the type of music you're listening to. Like there's so many choices you can make to better align with your values. And it's not easy. It's definitely hard to, whether you're cutting off friends or making a lifestyle change, like these things don't happen overnight. Um, but it definitely is possible. And you see it every day just with people like you, Simon, just speaking up about your story and sharing these things. It really does inspire people. So wrapping up thank you so so much for coming on and for everything you do it's amazing that we get to connect from across the world it's my favorite thing ever um and yeah i just know that you are inspiring so many men out there both with mental health issues and without just with embracing those emotions and feeling okay to talk about them yeah thanks for having me on i really enjoyed our chat and have to do it again sometime <laughs>